Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Unqualified Film Bros. I am Ben. Um, I am the new host of this show. For Hooray! This. Hail Ben! Uh, committed a mutiny hmm. or a coup. <laughs> and, um, I just love that every time you've hosted, which is two or three times now, you've started by introducing yourself, even though we've done 30 of these by now. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I'm only the host so many times. It's true. We got to move it around more. I can't do this every exactly. week. Mm. Um, so yeah, we're talking about the Northmen this mm-hmm. week. Um, what do you guys think? <laughs> ah, he said the line. He said the line. Whoa! No one's ever said that before. Ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. It's inter. It's interesting. Obviously. Now I need to watch like all of Robert Eggers filmography, but I haven't sa- sadly, but this, so this is my first film with him. I, it is interesting. I both simultaneously love the film, but I feel like it didn't fully become great until like the middle point when it retroactively made the story better due to a revelation in the story that I felt made made it work a lot more for Declan, me. we've all seen the movie yeah. there's a spoiler yeah. alert in effect i was you can about say to just state spoiler <laughs> alert for all of you watch watching who haven't seen it yet anyway the revelation about omelette's um mother what's her name what's what is her actual name uh, good gruden something like that like john gruden <laughs> anyway um <laughs> gundrun that Help. <laughs> gundrun was was in like either either possibly involved with or at the very least actively supporting of the crew of the coup that killed um his father I, I felt like i felt like that just inherently it both like made everything that had come before much more complicated or like more more three-dimensional kind of and what came after like it just it just made his character like i like it made omelette a much more compelling character for me in general because i felt as though yeah yeah, he went from borderline two-dimensional to a 100% three-dimensional character because he suddenly has to deal with the fact that his pre-conceived uh, like worldview, like his preconceived Viking worldview was suddenly completely kind of shattered by his mother, his mother and all that uh, he has to deal with the consequences of, of that. And so, you know, I say all that to say that I love the Northmen, but I but it was because of the twist, if we could, if you could call it that, that I felt like the story actually worked for me and it wasn't just like a beautiful film, but it became just a truly just unambiguously great film. Yeah. For me. And I think um, that's one of my favorite parts of the movie is that mm-hmm. it, for the first half, it really just sets it up like, you know, this is a revenge tale. And even you see like him as a little boy, you know, saying he's going to, avenge his father you know save his mother and everything Mm -hmm. Um, and then the same thing when he's like uh older and more muscular really really muscular Mm -hmm. um and i think that's alexander skargs workout routine (laughs) It's, it's kind of crazy if you think about it you know he really just spent his entire life based on a lie after after that point and i think it's it's so poignant because it comes in the middle of the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it gives that extra weight. That's the uh, thing it happened at the right time in the yeah. movie too. Not just that it was the you know right at the middle point, but it was at a pretty important um, crossroads of okay, he's like really close to achieving everything that he set out to do, mm-hmm. and this is like the wrench that gets thrown into his plans. Yeah, yeah. His Every- his whole situation as you know, Declan, you put it really well. Um, his whole worldview is upended by this revelation. And it happens, you know, towards the end of the second act. So mm-hmm. everything we see, you know, we, when he's on the boat with Olga, when he's fighting Fjolnir on the volcano, this conversation he has with his mother is weighing on him for all of that because 
it's changed how he views his mission of revenge. Mm-hmm. And I think that, mm-hmm. as you said, Declan, it it really turns him into this well-rounded character beyond what he had been in the first two acts of the film, where you're seeing this, you know, hell-bent on revenge Viking mm-hmm. now have a little bit more nuance to his fight. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because, you know, his mother, she was part of it. She has mm-hmm. to die. And now there's another kid had between his mother and Fjolnir mm-hmm. and you know Fjolnir's son from his previous uh well from his uh, his other son's mother mm. I don't know <laughs> what we can call that relationship <laughs> mm. but yeah it's yeah th- that that arc especially in the third act is really strong yeah like I think like when I was watching the first half like, I kept seeing, like, the imagery of, like, animals and, like, you know, animals and humans and also, like, children and all that. And so I think in some way, the film was making me think it was, shallow is not the right word, but, like, not as introspective as I would want it to be per se like, at the very least it la- i thought it the story lacked new new i said i thought it was like oh you know it's about how being a viking makes you kind of like being a beast or something like that and it's like wow robert eggers thank you for spending 90 minute 90 million dollars to tell me that being a viking is like being an animal and all that but then like i said the twist happen happens and and that, and by the, yes, and by that, it shows that this film is partially about the creation of, like, the idea, like, the mindsets that people create for themselves and, like, what actually drives people and all that, you know, by revealing that his mindset wasn't entirely correct. Like the the entire film suddenly like becomes, yeah, I, I felt was a like deeply thematic and really interesting uh, exploration of this character, all these characters who you at, th- at first think are one thing, but then learn are more than just what they appear to be more than just scheming uncle or uh, wronged prince, you know? Well, speaking yeah. speaking as a Robert Eggers okay. virgin before this viewing, isn't that, and I'll, I'll defer to Ben here because he's the one who's seen the most of his films, mm-hmm. but isn't that sort of a calling card of Robert Eggers is characters that are more than they appear on the surface? Oh, for sure. I mean, he really loves to have a... Uh... I mean, one of his favorite influences is uh, Ingmar Bergman. So he, he loves to deal with, you know, the human condition. Mm-hmm. Um, How much does his love for dealing with the human condition compare to his love for Naked Will and the Foe? I was warned about that. <laughs> I was warned that less than 15 minutes into the movie, Willem would, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I had to ask. Willem the Foe was kind of jacked, though. Mm, it's true. It's true. You know? I mean, Willem Dafoe's workout routine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to talk about uh, actually the Willem Dafoe uh, scene mm. where, you know, he it is very supernatural. Um, and he starts to get them to bark like dogs <laughs> or wolves. Mm. I, I really like the uh, sort of animal inspiration for all of them. Mm. Vikings believe that uh, an animal, you know, inhabited your soul. So determine, you know, who you were. Were you a wolf? Or like later on, this wolf becomes a sheep. Mm. Um, they talk about, you know, going to the shepherd. I think, uh, is it Olga? One of the mentions, you know, you can't disguise yourself north yeah. mm-hmm. in your sheep's clothing or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, isn't Ethan Hawke's character literally called like the War Raven? Yes, yes, I think that's right. So the like, Ravens uh, are a different 
part of uh, mythology. The ravens were the eyes and ears of Odin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew I knew it had to do with Odin because the first yeah. three Thor movies. <laughs> it's also, uh, the ravens come and free uh, Amleth from his chains. Mm -hmm. Or do uh, they? <laughs> no, they do. I think it's one of the interesting things <laughs> about this movie is it, it makes very clear that it is supernatural and that mm -hmm. these guys do exist. Valhalla does exist, um, which makes the Sort of, so wolves, you know, they hunt in, in packs. They care about their pack. Um, just like, you know, he cares about his mother and his father. He wants to avenge. And then later on, Amleth wants to, like, you know, protect his newborn children, um, whereas sheep are sort of let. But in a weird way, like, Amleth's entire journey is based on a lie. Um, and the gods still enable him to, you know, get revenge. That's his duty. Um, his fate. His fate. Can I run fate? It's, and, it's and an that's, our, yeah, uh, I was just going to say that, you know, that plays into the supernatural element is that fate is a real thing. And yeah. you, you, you have to fulfill your destiny in this, in this world that Robert Eggers is building mm -hmm. that, you know, there's no escaping. You know, he, he talks to Olga in the third act when they're on the boat saying like, I have to choose between hate for my enemies and kindness for my kin. And I choose both. Mm. Well, your fate is to choose between the two of them. And he chooses hate for his enemies. And that ultimately <laughs> leads to his mutually assured destruction in his mm. volcano fight with Fjolnir. But I think that's a, well, that's the interesting thing. And in that he doesn't just choose, he chooses both. He doesn't just choose one because in a way he can't escape his fate in that he has to choose uh, to kill mm. to save his you know newborn children. You could imagine like his like the one um, I'm blanking on his name, but the one young prince who is the child of his mother and uh, Fjolnir, Fjolnir Gundr uh, mother child of Gundrun and Fjolnir. John like, Gruden. It, what? John Gruden. Yeah, yeah. Uh, him, him doing exactly what what um, what uh, Omelette did, and like go off and dedicate his life to revenge in order to kill kill his family. You know, you could imagine yeah. him doing that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, he sees, and also earlier in the you know film, he he talks to Cirrus, and she mentions you know the uh, uh, what is it, uh, Maiden King. Mm. that will be born which is one of his children mm -hmm. so i expected more bjork in this one we only got her for one scene i didn't expect her that much which character which character did bjork she was the play the Cirrus. oh that was bjork oh my god sorry i i wow i totally she was actually... she was hyped up so much in the trailer and in the promotional material mm -hmm. i was like but come on she's got to come back she plays a very important role yeah true um, He's coming back in the sequel. I mean, we'll, don't worry. We'll the sequel the to the two that. Northmen. <laughs> <laughs> no one gets like a ton of screen time if you think about it, other than like mm. Alexander Skarsgård and some of old up, but it's mainly Alexander Skarsgård. I mean, Anya Taylor Joy is a fair. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Though you know, speaking of Bjork's appearance, I got to tell you, talk about the one thing that I did kind of not love, and this is kind of like a problem with like viking cinema in general now as i said the film showed that it's more than that but one problem with viking cin like cinema or viking there's stories about vikings is that simultaneously vikings are interesting and cool but they're also hard like committed horrible acts of like historically like like horrible acts of violence against people and all that and i i talked with uh, with uh, ben i think uh, yes i ben i think i was talking to you and i mentioned it in my review on letterbox the scene of like of the vikings even if omelette didn't take part in it the scene of the vikings throwing the children into the barn and then burning it like i won't lie that was 
That was pretty fucked up. And I know it's necessary for maybe showing the dark place omelets in and all that, but I think I don't know. I think it's sort of realism. I mean, it's not just a Viking culture, like, you know, messed up shit like that happened in every culture back in. Mm-hmm. For sure. You know, the Middle Ages, before that, like with the Romans, the Greeks, Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like. The the nature of raiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I can't actually fault the film for including it because I know it's like necessary for, if if you're telling a story about Vikings, like actually it's going to have, something like that's going to have to happen. You need the brutality. But yes, I mean, exactly. The, the, the interesting thing that comes with that is that, like, because it's supernatural, the gods are kind of messed up too. Like, mm-hmm. In that they don't really care necessarily what happens on Earth as long as they're prepared for Ragnarok. You know, mm. every uh, every good soldier needs to die in battle. Um, Does Ragnarok ever come up in the film? I, I, I just no. trying to. Remember. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. But that is. So, you know, I don't know how much Norse mythology you guys know. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is a big part in it, you know, that you need to die in battle. And that was actually a part, Mm -hmm. Uh, like 50% or, you know, half of them uh, who died in battle got to go to Valhalla. Um, I think the others went to uh, the other, it was Hell, yeah. H-E-L, Hell. (laughs) Yeah, or at least in, the, in in the film, when they go to the volcano, it's the gates of hell, and it's H E L. Yeah, it's how stall in mythology. That's the, the yeah, title yeah, card. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying to think of the god. So they go serve Odin and Valhalla. Um, those are supposed to be the best soldiers that you know can drink and be merry until Ragnarok comes, and then they go out and defend Odin essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all about you know the gods self-preservation in a way mm-hmm. uh, but it, it is really interesting that they you know supply him with this destiny to take revenge and then die essentially the, the one thing i do wonder it, did anyone i i'm i should have looked this look this up or anything like that is beheading, is there anything significant in Norse culture? Was there anything significant about a character being beheaded versus being stabbed in the heart? Because I feel like there was something, but I wish I knew if like, was when, when like, you know, the king was beheaded, was that like a specific slight or was that just like a, another way to die, you know? Or like- I think that was just another way to die. Okay, okay. If it was, if it was. In the movie, they have like these funeral rites for the people who didn't die in battle and they like chop off their heads or whatever to like Mm. hasten their ascent to. That's how you free the soul. Mm. Just open up Um, the neck. And to be honest, I I have to go back and check. I'm not sure how accurate some of the portrayals are. I know he said the. Their clothing didn't exist. They didn't have any special clothing. Um, so Eggers made that stuff up. Uh, I'd imagine that, you know, Valhalla is very important to Vikings. So I'm sure they did something like that. For sure. Um, but I don't think that it means anything. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. him getting beheaded. I think it was. Yeah, pretty- I wasn't sure if it's like, oh, if you get beheaded, you. That's dishonorable somehow i like i don't know but no i think it, it's, okay, so uh, it, it's just revenge right you know his mm-hmm. father got beheaded yeah so he, he wants to be mm-hmm. it means traditionally we're beheaded i guess mm-hmm. yeah it's also kind of funny speak speaking of which like a little bit just like the fact that like <laughs> the fact that he fled to iceland and how like his his uncle i mean like he like it is it is interesting that he did like like as that you know random Viking says he killed his brother for nothing you know it's like wow thank you for this yeah. really thematic conversation bruh you know and all that, that, and all yeah. that. that was kind of disappointing for me mm-hmm. was you know Fjolnir killed his brother to seize his kingdom and his wife and mm-hmm. land and titles and all that but then he ends up as a farmer. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's like Amleth is getting revenge and trying to take back his kingdom, but the kingdom that he's going after is a farm. Yeah, it's 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 funny because it works for the story. Oh, the yeah. setting, the it, setting for that, and Eggers has a great way of capturing these settings in a way mm-hmm. that feel authentic to the era he's trying to portray in the film. But it worked. I, think- I just wasn't expecting it, and it kind of it was a little jarring to see. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's going after a farm. Yeah, I I think that kind of makes it even more um, poignant though with the reveal because like he's he has nothing left. All that yeah. he's left now is revenge. He no longer has you know a kingdom or yeah. or anything else. Um, you know he's got no family, so all he has is Olga and his mom and you know revenge. Mm-hmm. Mom turns out to be not what he thought. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of creepy. Yeah, kind of weird. And not not in the supernatural horror thriller creepy <laughs> no. way, just like real when Nicole world. Kidman creepy. Went and uh, kissed him. Someone in no. the movie theater went, "Ew!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry I, for being so loud about that, Ben. I don't know how you could hear me from hundreds was, of miles away. I thought it was funny after all, like you know, the gore and blood and guts. <laughs> <laughs> it it oddly enough came across to me as I felt like the film had a few like obviously it's gonna have have this it had a few like sort of subtle like semi-subtle references to hamlet in in it you know like i liked how well, it's yeah. based on the same when, tale really yeah exactly 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 you know so, so it's like a big found that like like the fact that like you know um will the skull is like a minor character and like you know he says like oh alas my poor friends like ah, I, I get that i get that so i felt like like his mother kissing him was like um a like subtle reference to like you know the idea of like hamlet being a character who has an oedipus complex and and thus is in love with gertrude his, mo- his mother throughout the play it's not like in t- it's one of it's one of those things I, yeah, is that I think the reason it was in there was partially because of referencing Hamlet. I think at all, I think it's a partial reference, and I also think um, it it also. Oh shoot! What was I going to say about this? <laughs> like the Lion King too. <laughs> well, they fought. It was <laughs> nephew versus uncle in front of flames at a volcano. Yeah, it was yeah, the Lion things. King. It was the last act of the Lion King. Probably. <laughs> The other thing was uh, it, it kind of shows like how much, how similar Amleth is to his father. And then mm. you know, they're both just like, you know, these ravenous beasts who want just revenge and blood and don't actually care about, you know, each other. Just the fighting in the name of someone. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think probably that. I think, I think also also shows uh, like I'll just it's like willingness to survive. I guess mm-hmm, mm-hmm, for real. Uh, also, like an- another just interesting aspect of the film, I think, is the relationship between Olga and Ham Hamlet. Mm-hmm. Hamlet. I'm, I always I I, I want to say Hamlet. Hamlet on the brain. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And all that. <laughs> but um. I feel like it's an interesting one that they have. I think that I was a little surprised, though I'm, I'm not mad about that. I don't, I don't uh, find this as a fault or anything, but I think I was a little surprised that their relationship was genuine, like kind of, like they did seem to actually care, care for one another by the end. I think there was a part of me that was thinking like, like, oh, I wonder if she's going to be, revealed that she was just playing him the whole time or something like i think what i took away from that is is that she was i don't really want to say you know a a plot device in a sense but she was a way to give omleth something more than revenge to live for Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was the first time in his life that he connected he even said verbatim you know Mm. it's the first time in his life that he's connected with someone yeah. And, and, and in that respect, I, I I I am glad that she didn't betray betray him and all that. I think it was cool that 
Amleth was given more to his life, like found more to his life. I think I, that, again, that's why I felt like the second half was made the first half better because it like, yeah, again, made him a more cool, a more better character because he realized, oh, just dedicating my life entirely to, re to revenge isn't actually all that great. And maybe, yeah. you know, living is okay sometimes. But it, it also is the dedication of like warriors to want to die in battle. You know, there is an unwillingness to like die of old age. Like you mm -hmm. see it earlier on where uh, uh, Gudrun wants um Oh, what's uh, the father's name? Uh, uh, like Harvey? No. One. Harvey? Wondell. Not Harvey, but he gives yeah. Hamlet's Wondell. parents, Harvey and Gertrude. <laughs> that's it? Yes, that's it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, he, he refuses to like abdicate the throne. He wants to die. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, he's probably kind of happy to be killed by his uh, brother mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it is technically dying in battle. You know, he, he had his sword. Got to fight fight them off. He was he was probably a little bit like, like you know, honestly, it's like, like yes. He's going to die, mm -hmm. essentially. That's what they imply because yeah. he had a terrible wound. That moment in the movie when, you know, you see young Amleth out with his father in the woods in that grove when the arrow whizzes by his head and hits his father mm. i wish and I, I wished this when i was watching the movie i wished this when i saw the trailers and knew we were going to be talking about it i wished that we didn't know that that was coming yeah because Ooh. seeing just the sound design of the silence and then the arrow whizzing by and hitting mm -hmm. a human it, would have been so jarring in the moment and that would have been yeah. so cool to witness it's without still, any knowledge of it coming it still worked for me because i was I, like yeah. I, for, I forgot that he was like like the fact that he was like you know like um you know like sticking hit like like trying to catch the snowflakes and uh and all and all that like i was like i was like oh man is there gonna be a scene but uh, like I was literally thinking, it's like, oh, is he going? Is he still not quite a man, even though he did the thing because he's playing in the snow? But then that happens, and I was like, yeah. and it, it did, it did still, still get me. I though I do agree. I wish, I wish there was somehow there could have been like no reveal of that whatsoever. That would. I fair. think the scene you're looking for there, Declan, is between Leto and Paul Atreides in the first act of Dune. <laughs> just father and son bonding alone mm -hmm. and that's not what this movie's about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm surprised ben ben was not the first person to bring up dune, <laughs> dune in this conversation yeah, I know. the northman i won't lie <laughs> ben's most anticipated movie of last year ben's most anticipated movie of this year mm -hmm. yeah uh, <laughs> it, it certainly uh lived up the expectations for me mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, this is a great introduction. If you're not a horror person like me, like I think this is a real good introduction to Robert Eggers' work because I mean, it still it still has a bit of like you know sp spooky stuff in it. But you know, as George brilliantly <laughs> told me the other the other day, you know, if if we can survive, Do not steal my joke. Do okay, not okay, steal okay. my joke. Please say your joke. I texted Declan last night saying, yeah, I think, you know, I'm not a horror person, but I think if I survive the horror elements of Morbius, I can survive this. <laughs> All right, more Morbius was scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, think, I think Ben was genuinely concerned that I would enjoy Morbius than I enjoyed The Northman, and that was not the case. <laughs> this, you know, Declan, you, you hit the nail on the head. This was a great introduction to Robert Eggers because... Mm. Yes, it does have some of his trademark supernatural horror elements. Mm -hmm. There's there are some scary parts. Not going to mm -hmm. sugarcoat it, but at the same time, what got me into this movie was the element of Viking revenge thriller, mm -hmm. and it absolutely delivered on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. just like how it's shot. I mean, every oh, it's gorgeous. That, like yeah. it's just shot amazingly. Mm -hmm. The yeah. cinematography and the score combined. Mm -hmm are just breathtaking.
Yeah. I was, I was originally worried. I was going to feel like, because I only, my mind has been entirely poisoned by a letterbox and that's how I think about all cinema. Now I was thinking it's like, Oh no, am I going to feel like this is a 4.5 movie with only a four story it, or something like that, but that was for only for the first half. And, you know, as I said, then it became a great film of the second, second half, but it was like, but it was always like, no, this, this is such gorgeous, like, like every, every single set and costume and like cinematography, all of it was like beautiful, beautiful stuff, you know? He, yeah, yeah. Technically speaking, it's a masterclass. Oh yes, yeah, for sure. Like uh, that ending shot, oh, and the beginning, both uh, mm-hmm. with a huge volcano. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think we can all agree though that like the the scene of you know them fighting, like you know shirtless uh, with swords in a volcano. They weren't just yeah. shirtless, buddy. They were yeah, naked. yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, straight. What am I saying? Yeah, the, the the scene of two naked men fighting fighting each other with swords uh, ran right from the volcano. By, Not uh, the swords you're thinking of. Those were digitally removed. Confirmed by Eggers that they CGI yeah. um, the penises uh, to prevent injury. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Will, Willem Dafoe got to do his thing in the first act of the movie, but then you go to the volcano and suddenly we can't show it. <laughs> yeah, Willem Dafoe wasn't, you know, playing around with uh, other swords. Well, Willem Dafoe doesn't <laughs> fuck around with that sort of thing. Like, oh, like he, he, he didn't even actually, it wasn't even in the. <laughs> uh, oh, no, Declan, you're oh, frozen. Declan. Declan, you're I know frozen. What was gonna say? It wasn't even in the. <laughs> oh, oh, Declan. <laughs> wasn't even in the. The perks oh. and pitfalls of working on Zoom, folks. Oh, buddy. Declan, if you but can I, hear I, us, wasn't even in the. Yeah, I think I actually, I, I think my I had a I watched well, a different is. version. Oh, sorry. Wasn't even in the. We're we're waiting with bated breath. Uh, what was it? Um, shit, I, I don't I don't know where I left where I left off. Uh, I, 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 inter- I interrupted. Wait, wait. What was the sentence? What was the sentence? Sorry, it wasn't even in the script. Yeah, it wasn't Willem even Defoe. in the in the script. Willem Dafoe just showed up that way, and everyone just went with it. You know, every everyone everyone was just vibing. He actually got I... his shooting schedule mixed up, and that was in the script for Spider Man No Way Home. <laughs> oh okay makes a lot more sense the talk about the green things. goblin oh jesus but i think Apparently, i actually uh, saw a different version than you guys oh yeah i didn't get the nudity i can't remember it, I, I don't think it was in the the cut that i saw yeah, yeah. i I will. I saw, I, I saw a matinee on a weekend so that might have been why but mm-hmm. I think I would have remembered that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> really sticks because, in the mind. Yeah, because you guys were talking about Willem Dafoe's scene earlier at the beginning of the episode, and I was like trying to think about, like, he he was wearing a mask for a lot of it. No, no, no. I know, but oh, I don't remember seeing a naked person. <laughs> well, the entire battle at the gates of hell is. Amleth yeah, and, and Fjolnir and they're naked. There was, I'm like almost 100% sure that they were wearing something in the version that I watched. Oh my gosh. <laughs> battle? There's no way for the battle. I yeah, I, I really I don't think that there was. Mm. And I think it's because of the time that I saw it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Wait, w- wait a minute. Hold on, Max. Were the main characters in the Northmen were they actually four penguins? One of them was named Skipper. One was named Rico. One was named Private, and one was named Kowalski. Was it was was that the case? I'll tell you what. No. Both yes. Alexander Skarsgård and Clay's Bang were both named Private in that scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you set me up for it. Clay's Bang, though. Let's talk about him. I know I'm not the host, but mm-hmm. is it so wrong that at times I was kind of rooting for him? I think it, he, he plays feels right? Character, if you think about it, I mean, yeah, in, 
apparently his brother was a huge dick mm-hmm. um, and loved loved um gundrun according to according to her you yeah. know I, what she's like you know it's, it's not like amazing or whatever but you know what he didn't mm-hmm. rape me <laughs> he's you you said it ben he's sympathetic at best mm-hmm. yeah there are reasons to find positives in the character of Fjolnir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It it like I think it it really like it starts to become where you could imagine a version very uh not dissimilar from like a, another like tragedy where like with um Fjolnir as the main character, you know, like his son's like dying around him and he has no idea yeah. what's going on and he's sort of getting desperate it comes with the uh, the twist you know which is mm-hmm. like yeah it turns out he's not actually the villain he's just you know the uh, the enforcer the means his to an end is, his mom is the uh, actual villain mm-hmm. so she's mm-hmm. the one that enabled his, uh, his father to die <laughs> and the one mm-hmm. that sentenced him to die yeah. Nicole Kidman was great. Her accent was not. <laughs> Her accent was kind of weird. I won't lie. Like I, like I, like. It, I believed it, Anya uh, Taylor Joy's accent more than I believe Nicole Kidman's accent. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And could yeah, I just Nicole say doing a great job? <laughs> the one thing I will say, or, uh, sort of. Sorry, uh, Nordic people. Where, yeah, where, uh, Skarsgård from. He's from North, Sweden. Sweden. I think the Scars Guards are from Sweden, yeah. I would say. You know, if I remember correctly. Leave in the comment if they're actually from Nor- Norway. You know? Sweden. Northern Sweden. European. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. But no, um, what I want to say, the one thing... Yes, I, George. <laughs> the one thing I just, I will say, I do think Gundrun might not have been completely truthful in her monologue to Amle. Like, I think she was intentionally trying to, like, there, there's a part of, I feel like she's a bit of an unreliable narrator in that, in that scene. So I don't know if she's full, basically, I don't know if she's fully evil, you know? Like, if... I don't know. Morality I, in this film is blurred. Yes. For pretty yeah, much exactly. everybody. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Like... She doesn't view it as evil. Um, it's like I, I can understand. So she wants, uh, you know, her ex-husband or whatever, the old king, um, to die because mm-hmm. he's a shit, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but she hates him, and I. She wants uh, Omelet to die because she's worried about, you know, revenge. Um, so it's sympathetic in that way, but also she wants her, you know, young child to die. But at the same time, like you said, we're out. He's blurred. You've got like a bunch of children burning and, you know, some mm-hmm. stuff like well, Amla yeah. participates in some of that. So where do you, where do you draw the line? You know, it's more just revenge more than like straight up morality. Mm-hmm. He only feels uh, empowered by like righteousness because the gods have chosen him for you know, revenge. And I think that's, it's more of a sign of like, you know, their personal troubles are mean very little to the gods. The Norns weave, you know, people to be fated to die, I guess, that would make good warriors. Um, But it's, it's sort of just interesting, you know, he is empowered by the gods, but he's also a deeply flawed character. So, the gods themselves are deeply flawed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting, like a very foreign culture. There, there aren't too many, you know, mythologies. Uh, obviously, there are ways to, you know, reach a certain like afterlife, and dying in battle is is not um, uh, uncommon in cultures. Certainly, like you know, samurai and stuff. You want to die in battle, but it is interesting that. God's chose him from a young age <laughs> to have this whole cycle. Um, and I think the important thing is like back with the Cirrus, you know, she mentions like the importance of his lineage and the children he has. That's what's really important. Like he has just been fated 
to die essentially and that's what he kind of realizes at the end when he wants to escape mm -hmm. and, you know just raise his children but he realizes that he can't um because he it's it's his destiny essentially to kill his uncle to prevent those children from possibly you know being killed because their their fates are more important to have a naked fight with his uncle at the gates of hell with two swords that they both brought you know that's yeah. his destiny. Is that familiar life experience for you Declan <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, that was the not the wink. answer I wanted. That was the worst wink I've ever given, and I've gone done. Well, yeah. I'm going to try to make that the thumbnail. So let's <laughs> let's go for that. I, think, I, I can't even argue with that. God damn it! Anyway, yeah, I, I, mean, I enjoy the movie too much to be to be too mad, but none the, nonetheless. You know. And hey, Hamlet uh, ends with a sword fight too. So sure. there you go. There's your other end. And so does the Lion King, but yeah. it's lions and. <laughs> they don't I, have swords I think, <laughs> it's claws. I think Robert Eggers probably was like bro what if we did the Lion King but with Vikings when, when he when he originally conceived it? <laughs> I, I, I wonder, wonder if he thought that is. and he apparently really was into a bunch of like random like Norwegian mm. Swedish films but Vikings that I'd never heard of and were in mm -hmm whatever language mm -hmm. and we can all expect uh, those films to be the next 10 or 20 that you watch <laughs> he also was watching andre rublev i don't tennis player huh <laughs> 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 oh, yes, no, no. No. i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> rublev <laughs> sorry <laughs> um and then aside from that, he said that he was watching, or uh, he was like inadvertently inspired by Conan the Barbarian, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know, um, I, I feel, I feel like, I feel like, um, I will avenge you, father. I will save you, mother. I will kill you, Fjolnir. That I feel like that is similar vibes to you know, crush your enemies, see them said, for you. He is... especially inspired him to do the uh, scene where he goes and gets the sword from the um, mm. the Draugr. I, I don't know how he is. Avenge, save, kill the new fuck, marry, kill. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Avenge, save, kill. There we go. All right, Ben. Right now, <laughs> Avenge, save, dying. kill. Uh, ben, for you, Avenge, save, kill. Max, me, and Declan. Oh my god! <gasps> god damn it! <laughs> I feel like to avenge someone, you're killing someone else. There's not enough people here, right? Yeah, yes. Because like someone needs to die and then I need to avenge you for some no, oh, okay. So so no, avenge you're avenging no, you're avenging them for someone else outside of this group. Yeah. That so so someone else does kill them, but you are you are going out of your way to right yeah. the wrong that was done to them. Also, the person that needs avenging doesn't necessarily need to be dead. True, true, as well. They could have just been slighted. Yeah, that's true. Quit stalling. Yeah. Answer the question. <laughs> I'll avenge Declan. Wow. Max. Wow. And then kill <laughs> that was not what I was this, is, this is full circle for everything Ben said at the beginning about the coup <laughs> for who's hosting. <laughs> you know, it's I, it, it's just because uh, you know George has the question. He was entertained by the Northmen. Mm -hmm. so. I, I was entertained by it. Mm. Yeah. You just not enough, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not enough. But were you entertained enough, George? Were you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> um, but All yeah, right. I mean, just wrapping this up, it's a crazy ride. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really well researched. Probably the best well researched movie you'll see in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, really stylistic. And just a great uh, revenge tale with a twist, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you if you like if you like your if you like hist historical dramas or 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 tales of Vikings, without any hesitation, go see this. Or if you just like good films, go see The Northman. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think it's 
it i mean my letterbox review was three words brutal just brutal so you got to be prepared for that um Mm -hmm. but but at the bottom line it is a great revenge story it's got that classic i haven't seen them yet but classic robert eggers feel of of thrills and horror and it's got a taste of what he can do as a filmmaker amplified by a great story great cinematography and a great musical score so Mm -hmm. you know i i'm glad i went in with an open mind and i'm glad i saw it yeah i I was outside my comfort zone for this (laughs) Sorry, I, I paused. Um, but yeah, this was this was me going out of my comfort zone. But I, I appreciate Ben's suggestion of the movie, and I'm I'm glad I saw it. Mm-hmm. Next up, Blade Runner. No, but Max, as you were saying. Um. Yeah. No. I, I I'm gonna be really similar to George again. Um. Look, it, it's definitely not something that I probably I would have gone to go see on my own if uh, this wasn't something we'd agreed on seeing and Ben had suggested. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely interesting. I think I'll need more time to more fully form like a, a good solid opinion right now. It might not be the highest, <laughs> but I did enjoy seeing it. And I, I, I think there is a lot to think about with the film. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Ben, you're hosting. Take us home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How do you end this? Uh, uh, what are we talking about next week? What movie are we talking yeah. about next week? What movie is coming out this weekend that we're talking about next week? Something I mean, tomorrow. Something staying alive. Tomorrow. Right? Yes. It's, it's the staying alive too. The sequel, yeah. this, <laughs> it's actually a prequel to Saturday Night Fever. Mm. But oh. and also a prequel to the other staying alive. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so we we are talking about uh, Doctor Strange 2 in the Multiverse of Madness next week. Uh, tune in then. Uh, see Good ya. Night. <laughs> <Good> night. <laughs>